Hi Geeks, welcome back to Next Week in History, a program where we uncover the past to unlock the future. Let's start with Monday, November 16th. That same day, in 1824, New York opened a new street, the 5th Avenue. Back then, nobody paid much attention to this, but today, 5th Avenue is probably the world's most iconic street. Why so special, you ask? Believe it or not, it all started with a decision to run the city parades through this street. After that, rich people started flooding in, building mega houses. Why? Because what's the point of being rich if you cannot enjoy the parade from your own balcony, sipping a freshly made cocktail while the rest of the world fights down there, trying to get a piece of the action? <laughs> The crisis of these mega houses was built in 1883 for Cornelius Vanderbilt II, who was the eldest grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, considered the second richest American ever. This house is the largest private residence ever built in Manhattan and had 137 rooms and 16 baths. Shit! These show off palaces gradually disappeared as the street turned more and more commercial. Today, Fifth Avenue is full of fancy brand shops shelling out an average annual rent of $3,500 per square foot. To some, that is pocket money though. Some like billionaire Leonard Blavatnik, who paid early this year 77.5 million US for unit 112A at 834 Fifth Avenue. Also on November 16, 1902, the Washington Star published a comic cartoon showing President Teddy Roosevelt refusing to kill a captive bear tied up for him to shoot during a hunting trip to Mississippi. You might think that was a happy day for the bear, but it seems that the bear was so beaten down already that Mr. Roosevelt asked someone else to put him down. Okay. Anyway, this same cartoon inspired New York candy shop owner Maurice Michtom to create a plush toy that went viral and was soon to be known as the teddy bear, becoming the world's most popular stuffed toy. So next time you hug your teddy bear, remember, yeah. Next Monday also celebrates the anniversary of the first intentional interstellar radio message. In 1974, humanity decided it was time to start talking with aliens and used the brand new Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico to send this message 25,000 light years away to the globular star cluster Messier 13. The message is supposed to encode information about Earth, humanity and our technology. Basically, who we are, how much we know and where to find us. They might as well have given them a note saying, Dear Mr. Alien, we are dumb and we want to get killed. Please come find us. What were they thinking? Sure, they didn't care. They will be long dead in 50,000 years. But why not send a more neutral message so we can get to know each other first? Something like, Hey alien dude, what's up? On the bright side, the message does not look very easy to read to me, so hopefully, when aliens in Messier 13 receive it, they will all be like, what the f Tuesday, November 17th. November 17th, 1558 marks the beginning of a new era in England. A wonderful period of time from 1558 to 1603 with peace, religious acceptance, with poetry and love, with Shakespeare. No wonder this time is often referred as the golden age in English history. And what wonderful event on November 17th started all this? Let me see, let me see. What? The death of Queen Mary I? But why? Queen Mary was a wonderful, caring person. Uh, well, except if you were a Protestant, because she kind of got over 280 of them born at the stake, earning her the loving name of Bloody Mary. And yes... The legend is true. If you repeat her name three times in front of a mirror while holding a candle, her ghost will appear and depending on her mood, she will tell you your future or she might rip your eyes. <laughs> or maybe not. Anyway, after her death, her 25-year-old half-sister Elizabeth succeeded her in the throne and started a rule of 44 years where the country flourished. So God bless the queen. But wait, there's more reason to celebrate next Tuesday, cause on that day in 1869, the world became quite smaller with the inauguration of the Suez Canal in Egypt. How come, you ask? Simple. Before that day, to go on a boat from Asia to Europe, you had to go all the way around Africa on a 4,000 mile sightseeing tour. But, with the Suez Canal linking the Mediterranean and the Red Seas, that distance became just 100 miles. Awesome! On the bleak side of things, the project was built using forced labor, and not just a few, actually more than 1.5 million people, with thousands of them dying during construction. Hmm. This, amongst other things, made the project very controversial, with strong French support and British opposition. However, turns out that the first ship that sailed through the canal was a British one. How come, you ask? Well, obviously, the first one to cross was supposed to be a French ship called Le Gleu, but they did not count on British sneakiness. 
and on the night before the canal was due to open, Captain Nairs of the British gunboat HMS Newport sneaked his vessel in total darkness and without lights through all the other waiting ships until it was in front of the French one. Imagine the face of the French when they woke up to find that the Royal Navy was first in line and that it would be impossible to pass them. Mon dieu, putain, c'est la merde des British! And that's one more reason why French and British are not best friends. Wednesday, November 18th. Let's start November 18, going back to the Middle Ages, where in 1307, legendary William Tell is supposed to have shot an apple off his son's head. Wait, don't tell me you have not heard of William Tell before. This guy is Switzerland's national hero, and no, he was not a chocolate maker, he was a badass crossbow warrior. The story goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a body terrorizing the peaceful Swiss people, and our hero, William, defied him. Bow to your hat and night! To punish his defiance, the tyrant wanted to execute both William and his son, but had a more cruel idea. <laughs> he told William that he could spare their lives if he could shot an apple off the head of his son from a distance of 120 paces, to which William said, Are you kidding, Mitch? Not Urlish! And bam! Apple is gone, and the body's like, What? Then I will imprison you for life! Only that William managed to escape, and of course went back to the tyrant and said, Yeah, like, hoo hoo! While well, he put an arrow through his evil forehead. That act of defiance motivated all the other Swiss people to start a rebellion which would lead to the formation of the Swiss Confederation. And after that, they started raising purple cows, became chocolate makers, made complicated watches and kept tons of banking secrets. So with so much going on, of course, there's no more time for fighting. Next Tuesday also marks the 87th anniversary of the release of Walt Disney's animated short Steamboat Willie, which is the first fully synchronized sound cartoon ever. Sure, who cares, but wait for it. Because that day is also considered Mickey's birthday! Yeah! But that's not really true, is it? Actually, Disney had made two silent Mickey Mouse films before, but they had been kind of a flop. Would that stop him? No way! He was committed to make it work, and he thought that adding sound to their cartoon would make it way cooler. Good thinking, my friend, good thinking. However, the first attempt to synchronize the recording with the film was a disaster, so the only way was to try again. But how are you gonna afford it? People said. Well, he sold his car, and to save money, he himself performed all the voices. And the result changed entertainment history forever. Thursday, November 19th. November 19th marks the anniversary of the death in 1703 of the man in the iron mask. Who was he? Well, no one knows for sure. He was a prisoner, but no one ever saw his face because it was hidden by a mask to keep his identity secret. Ooh, tell me more. So it seems that a man supposedly named Ostoche Dogger was arrested around 1669 under very mysterious circumstances. He would be jailed for life, he could only have the company of one person and his jailer could only speak to him once a day and only about his physical needs, nothing more, otherwise he would be executed. So just like that, it seems that the man in the iron mask was held in several French prisons for a period of 34 years until his death. But who was he? Voltaire, a French writer, claimed that this man was the older, illegitimate brother of King Louis XIV, aka the Sun King, and Alexander Dumas further expanded the conspiracy theory in his saga The Three Musketeers, claiming that the prisoner was Louis XIV's identical twin. Just one thing is for sure though, he was someone that a very powerful person did not want to be seen, but a person that he could not just simply get killed. Mystery! It is no mystery though that US President Abraham Lincoln knew how to make a kick-ass speech. On the afternoon of November 19, 1863, four and a half months after the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln delivered what is considered to be one of the greatest and most influential statements in the history of the United States. In just over two minutes, he reiterated the principles of human equality and redefined the civil work as a struggle, not just for the Union, but for that very principle of all men being born equal. Today, everyone admires the power and concision of the message. But did you know that the most probable reason for the speech being so short and to the point was that Lincoln was feeling feverish and about to develop smallpox? Friday, November the 20th. November 20th, 1910 marks the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. Before that day, Mexico had suffered 34 years of dictatorship under Porfirio Diaz. The economy well, had been growing, but the rich were richer and the poor were poorer. Yeah, sounds familiar, right? So discontent kept growing despite a systematic silencing of any opposition. So when Diaz announced in an interview that he would not run for re-election, the opposition, led by Francisco Madero, became more active and gained fast support, and that kind of made Diaz go back on his word and imprison Madero just before the elections. However, 
Madero escaped to the United States shortly after and from San Antonio issued the Plan de San Luis de Pontosí, where he called for a rise to national arms on November the 20th. All that sparked a revolution that would lead to the proclamation of the Mexican Constitution and that forged pop culture legends such as Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa. And a different type of revolution happened on November 20th, 1985, when, as most of you geeks will already know, Windows 1.0 was released. This year marks the 30th anniversary, so if you own any device running Windows, let's celebrate it this Friday. Take your device out on a date, get some cake, you know, make the device feel special. Anyway, back to Windows 1.0. Not surprisingly, the system was not the prettiest, not the coolest, or neither the best performing operating system. But as with many other things, somehow Bill Gates and Microsoft pull it off and establish it as the dominant system around the globe. However, initial reception was poor. Critics felt that the system did not meet their expectations and suffered from performance issues. Really? Windows performance issues? No way! Did you mean the horrible blue screen of death? <laughs> well, for the better or for the worse, Windows did make a difference. So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to... Okay, this is weird. Saturday, November 21st. On November 21st, 1694, baby François-Marie Arouette was born somewhere in Paris, La France. But no one would ever remember that name, because before turning 25, while being in prison, this person decided to create a new name for himself, breaking with his family and his past and becoming a whole new person, a person whose ideas would resonate across Europe. His name? Voltaire. And now you might be like, okay, I still haven't ever heard of this guy, you know? Okay, okay, so maybe he's not famous now, but trust me, he was all the rage back in his day. He was the Justin Bieber of writer, philosophy, and history. And he was a passionate defendant of civil rights, freedom of expression, and separation of church and state. He's also famous, by the way, for being one of the craziest coffee addicts in history, drinking it 50 to 72 times per day. Per day, you heard me. Coffee, give me some coffee. <sighs> But instead of killing him, all that caffeine running while in his blood made him uber productive, writing over 2,000 books and 20,000 letters over his 83 years of life. So grab that Starbucks venti cap and cheers to Voltaire. But Voltaire is not the only genius to celebrate on November 21st. That same day in 1877, Thomas Edison's life changed with his invention of the phonograph, an almost magical machine that could record and play sound using tin foil on a cylinder. How did he pull it off? No idea, but hey, he invented the light bulb, so surely he had tons of ideas. <laughs> okay, sorry, bad joke. Anyway, the phonograph was truly an amazing invention and he became known as the Wizard of Menlo Park. So let's thank Mr. Edison, because just imagine how boring life would be without music all around. Bonus fan fact. Can you guess what were the first words that Edison spoke into the phonograph? Was it testing, testing, one, two, three? Was it? No! It was something way deeper than that. <clears throat> Let me show you. Mary had a little lamb, whose fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. And with that bombshell, we finished November 21st. But wait! Is there another genius that did something on this day? No way! Yes! On this very same day in 1905, Albert Einstein published his famous paper Ist die Trackheit eines Korpen von seinem Energiehalt abhängig? Which, as you can surely tell by its name, it's the paper that reveals the relationship between energy and mass with the famous formula E equals MC square. So what a brilliant day, full of genius, full of amazing inventions, full of crazy people. Uh, let's move to something a bit damber now. Sunday, November 22nd. Let's start Sunday with some hardcore medieval action. On November 22nd, 1307, Pope Clement V issued an order to Christian kings in Europe to arrest all Templars and seize their assets. I'm sure you've heard about the Knights Templars. They were an order of badass warrior monks that was established right after the First Crusade. Initially, their mission was to protect pilgrims on their journey, but over the years they gained enormous power and wealth, becoming some sort of huge financial conglomerate. They could pass freely through any border, they owed no taxes to anyone, and they responded only to the Pope. But all that power and success generated a hell lot of resentment. And one specially pissed off guy was King Philip of France. He had huge debts with both Jews and the Knights Templar that he could not repay, 
and he needed even more money. What to do? <laughs> Easy peasy. His solution was messed up, but very effective. First, in 1306, he expelled all Jews from France and seized all their assets. Second, in 1307, he arrested a bunch of Knights Templar, created a bunch of ridiculous accusations about them, tortured them until they confessed, and then used his influence over the Pope to get them out low and seize all their assets. And just to make sure they could not have a proper trial and undo their confessions, he burned them at the stake. Eh, voila, we have money now! Shit. Another sad event also marks November 22nd in modern history. That day, in 1963, President of the United States John F. Kennedy was shot to death by Lee Harvey Oswald while riding an open limousine in Texas. And this event was captured on tape and shocked the world. Even more shocking was that although Lee Harvey Oswald was captured shortly after, he was shot dead two days later while in police custody by Jack Ruby, a Dallas nightclub owner. That was crazy. So all those events, together with suspicious evidence leads, have generated multiple conspiracy theories. And they involve parties such as the CIA, the Mafia, sitting by President Lyndon B. Johnson, Cuban President Fidel Castro, or the KGB. The truth is, something smells fishy here. But probably, we will never know the truth. I don't know, what do you think? But I don't want to end this episode on such a dark note, so let's remember November 22nd also as the day 20 years ago when Pixar's first film production, Toy Story, was released. Toy Story was the first feature-length computer animated film, and it was directed by John Lasseter, who had been fired from Disney, and with Steve Jobs as executive producer, so what a dream team. Toy Story is about the touching story of unwanted toys, and it features Woody the Cowboy Doyle, an astronaut action figure Buzz Lightyear, and it was a huge success and is considered now by many as one of the best animated films ever made. And we at Coconuts are lovers of animation, so Toy Story, happy birthday! Now, that is a much brighter note to end the episode, so now join me as I sing You've got a friend in me You've got a friend in me When you watch my videos every week And you click that like that it feels so sweet and then you subscribe, you can surely bet. Oh, you've got a friend in me. Come on! You've got a friend in me. See you next week! You've got a friend in me. Oh my god, this is so good. <laughs>